All right, thank you everybody for joining us for our second uh, virtual seminar, virtual IGPP seminar for a quick uh, uh, self-introduction. For those of you who are not familiar with me, I'm Tian Zhe Liu, a new postdoc scholar working with Peter Scheer on upper mental structure beneath the contiguous US. And I'm the organizer of the IGPP seminar this quarter. So please let me know if you have any comments and suggestions about the seminar. Today, we are very happy to have Professor Matthias Morsfeld, who is the newest faculty member in our department to give our department seminar. Matt, he got his bachelor degrees from Technical University Darmstadt in Germany, and his master and PhD from UC Berkeley in mechanical engineering. After getting his PhD, he was a postdoc fellow at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and UC Berkeley and a visiting professor at IPGP in France. He then became an assistant professor at the Department of Mathematics of the University of Arizona and finally joined us as an assistant professor uh, last year. Matt's research focused on interdisciplinary mathematical and stochastical modeling, data assimilation, Monte Carlo sampling, and reduced order modeling. Matty was the winner of the Alfred Sloan Research Fellowship in 2016 for his distinguished accomplishments in science and engineering. With this, uh, let's, let's welcome Matty to give his talk titled Numerical Challenges in Bayesian Inference, Inference Ego condition problems, high dimensional problems, and twice dimensional problems. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming and zooming in. And I'm very happy to see Alexander Chorin here, who came in from Zooms in from Berkeley and who has been very influential in my postdoc time and showed me um, much of the ways that that I came to appreciate and understand, and much of what I show you here is, is heavily influenced by working with him for many years. So I will talk about Bayesian inference and uh, mostly the numerics of Bayesian inference. So it's not, um, it's not directly connected to an earth science or geophysical application, but I will show a few examples um, towards the end. And then the, the challenges are in ill-conditioned problems, high-dimensional problems, and trans-dimensional problems. So I'm only talking about interesting problems and not the ones that are easy, easy to solve. And I'll start by uh, just very briefly uh, setting up the, the stage and introducing my notation so that we all know what, what we're talking about. So I have here a cartoon that uh, I use to illustrate what Bayesian inference is, is basically merging mathematical or computational models with observations. And here I have a, a simple mathematical model that is a differential equation, dx dt is f of x, where f is a given function, and I have an initial condition for that ODE as well. And then I can uh, solve it numerically and I can plot, for example, the state x as a function of time. And that would be in my cartoon, this uh, brown line here. If I take myself seriously and I really think of this as a model for a um, uh, geophysical process, then I might be able to also obtain uh, data or observations of this process. And in my cartoon, these data are uh, illustrated by these red dots. And some associated errors are uh, uh, illustrated by these arrow bars. Um, and now you can see that the model is quite far away from the observations and far here is to be interpreted with respect to the length of these arrow bars. And now what you want to do, or what Bayesian inference can help you uh, to do, is to compute, um, to basically um, wiggle with the mathematical model here, for example, slightly change the initial condition to obtain a state trajectory such as the blue line here that passes nearby all four uh, observations that I have. And again, near is to be interpreted in terms of these error bars. And an even better solution would be to compute what is illustrated here by this yellow cloud, where I wouldn't say that I'm quite sure that this state at a certain time is, is given by, by a particular number, but rather I would tell you about a range where I expect that state to be. And then with some luck, the, the system that you're actually modeling uh, the state trajectory of that process would actually be well within the cloud of possibilities that, that you have predicted. Now, if you want to uh, put an equation to this, a simple equation is to say your observations are a mathematical model um, 
that depends on some model parameters theta, and then you account for error, for example, by adding a random variable, and often that random variable is, is chosen to be uh, Gaussian with a mean zero and a covariance matrix R. Then this equation here defines a likelihood, which gives you the probability of the observations given a set of model parameters. So those could be initial conditions or boundary conditions or other things. And based on my assumption of this uh, Gaussian uh, error variable here, I can just write down what that is. And you can see that it's basically uh, connected to a weighted mismatch of the data and the, the model predictions. And in addition to this equation, I might have some um, uh, basic knowledge about the model parameters. For example, if those are um, uh, permeabilities or, or some other um, parameters that have uh, physical meaning, I might know that they must be positive or they must be within some bounds. And I can try to incorporate that information in form of a prior distribution and then put the two together to obtain a posterior distribution, which now would describe the probability of the model parameters given the observations. And that is basically proportional to the prior and the likelihood that I have uh, shown you here. Now, this posterior distribution is an interesting object, and it's uh, uh, because it basically describes what in the cartoon would be this yellow cloud of, of possibilities um, that the state could, could take on. So perhaps not uh, uh, surprisingly, most numerical methods for solving inference problems are based on this posterior distribution. For example, you can do an optimization, so you can find parameters that maximize this posterior distribution. And, or you could do um, a Monte Carlo approach where you, rather than finding one particularly good set of parameters, you would actually try to uh, represent this posterior distribution by an ensemble. So those would be samples from this distribution with a hope that the ensemble average, for example, is approximately equal to the posterior mean and ensemble covariances are approximately equal to the posterior covariances. So in that way, you can use your ensemble to calculate uh, quantities that are defined in terms of the posterior distribution. Now, to give you a, um, a quick, uh, simple example, I have here a delay differential equation for a quantity H that is actually connected to cloud depth of a predator prey model for, for cloud uh, systems, which I will probably not get to talk too much about. But it's a simple delay differential equation. So if dH dt is um, basically a linear term and then a nonlinear term that also has a delay t in here. And then I want to estimate these four parameters, um, given that I have some noisy measurements of the, of the, pro of the uh, quantity H, and I have given myself some parameter bounds for um, these four parameters, H0, tau, alpha, and T. And then if I define the posterior distribution and draw samples from it, I can look at the solution in terms of a triangle plot so that you see in the lower right corner here, where I plot histograms of all one and two dimensional marginals of this posterior distribution. And then you typically see that the, all the probability mass is, is focused on a, on a particular region of, of the parameter space. And you can also read from these plots, you can read, um, for example, correlations that, that, the two, uh, that two of the parameters uh, uh, exhibit. And again, you have the posterior distribution, which is a prior, which gives you some bounds on the parameters, and then the likelihood, which is basically the model data uh, mismatch. And if you are more used to inverse problems and regularization, you can view the prior as another way of, of incorporating uh, regularization into the problem. I have to be a little bit careful here because um, the posterior distribution that, that I'm going to spend a lot of time on trying to represent numerically uh, is basically an object that you have created yourself. So it's the process of a, it should be the process of a, uh, it should be the result of a long modeling process because you have to write down this equation. So you have to carefully think about the model and then also very carefully think about how you represent model error. Because, uh, because as you can see, you have choices for the prior and you have choices for the likelihood and they directly define the posterior distribution. So if you make uh, poor choices on either the prior or the likelihood, then you will also get uh, a posterior distribution that may not be very useful for you. Um, so while I will not spend a lot of time in this talk on um, trying to view this as a modeling problem, I want to emphasize that it has to be very carefully, uh, that all the problems have to be very carefully set up or else the solution that you compute will not be, uh, will not be very useful. Okay, so now I want to uh, briefly tell you what my talk is going to be about. I will 
um, review two techniques for uh, drawing samples from a given distribution. Those are called important sampling and Markov chain Monte Carlo. And then I will spend some time on uh, thinking about when these uh, sampling techniques are easy to do, when are they uh, feasible or you know, they're they doable but difficult, and when do I think that it's currently impossible to, to solve these problems. And then I'm very excited to tell you a little bit about a transdimensional Markov chain Monte Carlo, where you have the complexity of your model essentially as, a, as an additional parameter that you want to estimate. And then I have prepared a couple of examples uh, to convince you that I'm not only looking at, uh, at simple models, but I have actually some uh, experience in, actually in using this on actual applications. So it's not all mathematics, it's also a lot of science, but I expect that I will actually not get to five. So I can do that maybe some other time. Okay, so to briefly review the Monte Carlo method, uh, I'm going to take a step back from any posterior distribution and just think of a random variable x that has a distribution p, which I will call the target distribution. And if I'm interested in the expected value of that random variable, I can write that down as an integral, so x times p of x dx. Um, and the Monte Carlo approximation is very simple. I draw uh, NE samples from the distribution P and I sum them up and the, I divide by the number of samples that I have NE. And as the sample size or ensemble size goes to infinity, the sum actually uh, uh, converges to this uh, expected value and to this integral. Uh, in terms of a cartoon, if my target distribution here is this orange bump in probability space, then the samples that I draw might be these uh, couple of dots that I have here, and then I would just sum them up and divide by NE and get an approximation of the expected value. Now this looks great, and it looks very simple, but it's deceivingly simple because this step of drawing samples from a distribution is directly only feasible in a handful of cases. For example, I can do Gaussians, uh, log normal distributions, um, I can do uh, uniform random variables and a handful of others, a handful of other special distributions, but if I make a connection to Bayesian inference where the target distribution is a posterior distribution that is defined implicitly by a model and, um, and, uh, and a set of observations that I'm given, it is likely that that does not fall into the family of uh, probability distribution that I can sample directly from. If that is the case, I can use a trick um, which is based on um, a typical trick that you see very often where you multiply and divide by the same number. So I write down again the expected value of x and I uh, multiply and divide by a quantity q which I will call the proposal distribution and then if you stare at it long enough or you just trust me you can uh, you can see that this now looks like a Monte Carlo average of the function x times p over q but with an expected value computed with respect to the proposal distribution q. So that turns the typical Monte Carlo average into a weighted average where the weights are the ratio of the target distribution and the proposal distribution. And my samples are now drawn directly from the proposal distribution Q. Now I have a lot of choices for the proposal distribution. I just need to make sure that I don't divide by zero. Um, so I might choose one that, or construct one that I, that I know how to sample from. If I uh, use a cartoon again to illustrate this, I have a target distribution again as the orange uh, bump here and I have a proposal distribution um, Q which is purple and now I draw samples from the proposal distribution so those are the purple dots here and then I can co I compute these weights which are the ratio basically of Q and P uh, sorry of P and Q at at the sample points and they tell me that not every sample is equally important so the samples that receive a high probability with respect to the target and the proposal are um, more important than the ones that are receiving a low probability with respect to the target distribution, for example. And now maybe from this cartoon, it becomes, uh, it is pretty clear that if you want to have a good um, important sampling algorithm and you need to um, decide on which proposal distribution to use, then you should try to make one that basically looks like the target distribution because you want to have a large overlap between the proposal distribution and the target distribution. Um, and I get back to that a little bit later, but uh, uh, there are some pros and cons for this technique. For example, it's very easy to parallelize. All the sampling can be done completely independently of each other. And that has led me to be part of a, um, uh, a 
a project in combustion chemi chemistry where we ran an algorithm of this type on a, on a very big DOE supercomputer. And together with Alexander Chorin, I worked on implicit sampling, which is a good or robust method to construct uh, proposal distributions that have um, uh, a significant overlap with a target distribution. Um, the a minor hiccup here in this setup is that there is a generic failure when you go to high dimensional problems and they don't have to be particularly high dimensional. Maybe once you get to a dimension of 50 or more, it, it can already be very tricky. And you need an additional step in addition to coming up with a good proposal, you need to exploit more problem structure. And we'll get, to, get back to that later on. Another technique that you can use to draw samples from a given distribution is Markov chain Monte Carlo. It is similar in the sense that it also uses a proposal distribution, but it's um, different in the sense that you um, that it's a sequential, it's a chain, so it's a sequential pro process. And basically, you are you you start your chain somewhere, and then you propose a, a move, and you accept or reject that move with a probability so that the stationary stationary distribution of the target of the, the stationary distribution of the Markov chain that you define is the, um, is the target distribution. Now, again, I want to maybe just um, make difficult things look a little easier and show you again a cartoon where I have uh, here a two-dimensional probability distribution. Red is, or dark red is a very high probability, and then um, yellow is lower probability, and blue is, is very low probability. And I started the chain here. I took uh, a couple of moves. Now I'm going to propose a new move. Since I'm going to um, a region of higher probability, this move is likely to be accepted. And then I keep going in this way. And then the, uh, the idea is that you visit places of high probability more often than places of low probability. And in that sense, you get an approximation of the target distribution by the um, Markov chain that you constructed. Now, if you look at the, if you open up papers on this stuff, you will see that there is, um, that there are many, just like there are many important sampling techniques that all differ by the proposal distribution. There are also very many uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo samplers that all use a different proposal distribution. It's harder to parallelize these algorithms because you have to know where you are in order to propose the next step. And there's also a problem in, uh, with respect to a scaling of the, uh, required number of steps that you need to take with the dimensions. It's a little bit, maybe less uh, less uh, brutal than an important sampling, but it's also there. Which takes me to uh, talking about when is this stuff uh, easy to do or um, doable, or when is it actually impossible? So you have two um, difficulties. Well, there could be more, but I'm going to focus on, on two difficulties. One is if you sample in spaces that have strong anisotropies, and the other one is if you just sample in very high dimensional spaces. Um, the the um, approach that you take to tackle these difficulties are very different though. So in high dimensions, my, um, my, uh, uh, I'm quite convinced that you need to exploit as much of the problem structure as possible in order to get to very high dimensional problems. It's similar to uh, actually to um, uh, just linear algebra if you solve ax equal to b, if, uh, if the dimension of x is very large, you cannot use a direct solver for, for that linear problem. You will need to use either a, a, a sparse solver or, a, or um, hope that your matrix is of low rank. And there's analogies to this situation in, in sampling as well. And if you look at anisotropies, you can make use of um, affine invariance, which basically reduces the effect that these anisotropies um, have. Now, it gets very difficult uh, as I said, when you have a very high dimensional problem, but you don't know anything about what the problem looks like. Just as, um, uh, as I said before, it, you have the same situation in just pure linear algebra where you cannot solve A is equal to B unless you make assumptions or you know something about the structure of A. Okay, but first, uh, maybe going back to the affine invariance and, and general purpose sampler. So here's again a, a two dimensional distribution which has a uh, an isotropy in the sense that the uh, the level sets of the probability here are, are stretched in the vertical di direction. So that means that if you construct your Markov chain, you will have to be careful because you want to take pretty small steps in the x direction and you want to take pretty large steps in the y direction. So you can get around that by uh, doing a lot of tuning. Um, 
or you can hope that your problem looks like the one on the right here where you don't have anisotropies and you, you can just take the same, basically the same step size in, in, in both directions. So this one would be, I would label as more difficult than this one uh, in terms of sampling, but the two might be connected by an affine transformation. So if you basically make a change of variable that is AX plus B, then you can transform this problem into this problem. And if you have a sampler that is uh, invariant under such transformations, then the two problems look exactly the same to this particular sampler. Um, so for an affine invariant sampler, the, all, all these problems are equally easy. Uh, and that takes me to a particular sampler that has this, um, this property, which is, uh, well, the Python package that came with it and that, that has become uh, very useful is called the MCMC hammer. And the uh, moves that that MCMC hammer code makes are called uh, stretch moves. And the basic idea is to use not just one Markov chain, but to use a whole ensemble of Markov chains and to uh, um, propose affine invariant moves that make use of the information in the ensemble. Because if you think that you have a, a, a collection of MCMC chains, there should be some information in where each, each uh, chain is at a, given, at a given instant. So the way that the uh, stretch move works is illustrated in this um, cartoon here where I have a chain of three Markov chains. One is green, one is red, and one is blue. And the Markov chains are here right now. And if I want to propose a move for the blue one, I pick one of my friends in the ensemble at random. In this case, I, I pick the red one and I drew a line and then I sample along that line. And now I make a, I propose a move for, uh, for the uh, green one and the green one picked the, the blue chain, I, I, uh, I draw a line and I sample along that line and then I, and then I, I repeat. So this is how the, um, how the stretch move works. And the re, you know, because you sample along these lines, that is basically guarantees the affine invariance of this, of, this, of this technique. Now I can show you this on a simple example where the um, uh, posterior distribution is, uh, is pretty stretched. So this is the, uh, Rosenbrock function. It's also often used to illustrate difficulties in optimization, for example. So here I have a uh, not affine invariant, very basic random walk metropolis sampler. And I don't know if the zoom uh, refresh rate is good enough, but if I run this, you will see that this uh, chain is basically stuck uh, down here and it makes occasionally moves, uh, moves around here, but it never, it never really explores uh, uh, this part of the of the posterior distribution or the target distribution. If you use the FN invariant MCMC hammer, uh, then you see that your ensemble is moving quite a bit and it's also moving along the uh, along this very thin. It's moving well along this very thin ridge of high probability. And in case the the uh, the video or the, the animation didn't work. I show you here the result in, again in terms of a triangle plot, where I take uh, one million, where I draw one million samples using a non-affine invariant algorithm and an affine invariant algorithm, and you see that with the affine invariant algorithm, you basically get you can already see the the function here, whereas the one that is not affine invariant was basically stuck and would uh, would give. I mean, if if you accept this as the numerical solution of the problem, you 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 would uh, it would be false. You would have, um, you would think that the probability is concentrated on this one little point, a very small region here, but where it's actually not the case. So it's important that your that your um, that your uh, numerics are appropriate to solve a problem. And I would say that if you have a problem that is not too high in dimension and you can use one of those ensemble samplers, uh, I don't think you would need to, to think much more as to what to do because they're, they're very robust and it's a very good general purpose algorithm if you don't know what your problem looks like and if the dimension is small. So I can deal to some extent with the uh, strong anisotropies. Now, if I go to high dimensional uh, problems, the, the, uh, the issues are slightly different. So um, uh, you can basically cook up very simple examples um, where you see a catastrophic dependence of the number of samples that you need um, with the dimension of the problem, uh, uh, with the dimension of the problem. So here is uh, the simple example. 
The target distribution is a, is a Gaussian that has a mean zero and a covariance matrix of the identity matrix. And the proposal distribution is also a Gaussian. It has this it has a correct mean, but it has a slightly larger uh, covariance matrix. So in each dimension, you make an error in the variance of, of size epsilon. And now if you compute um, the required number of samples, so that's a heuristic um, that you can just compute for this example, you will see that the number of samples that you need is exponential in the dimension of the problem. So that means that it is pretty hopeless to do this unless your uh, dimension is small. And then I would say maybe it's uh, tens or, or so rather than hundreds or hundreds of thousands or millions. Um, but that is only at first sight and I get back to that uh, um, in a little bit how to, how to get around this. Now, similarly, uh, you can do the same for, you can do a similar check for MCMC. Now here in the important sampling case, I could just compute, I basically could compute the scaling. Uh, in MCMC, I uh, I could not, but I could just run uh, uh, I could just run numerical experiments. So I can also define a uh, required ensemble size for a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm, and then I can look at how this required ensemble size scales as a function of the dimension of the problem for the same simple uh, target distribution, which is a Gaussian. And you see that this uh, MC hammer, for example, has a linear scaling in the dimension. Uh, the random walk metropolis, that is a typical MCMC algorithm that you first learn about, has, a, has also a linear scaling in N. And then if you go to um, slightly more uh, advanced samplers, for example, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, you get a sublinear scaling. And for Mala, which uses gradients, you can also see uh, a sublinear scaling. So it's a, it's a, it, it, if you use these algorithms, obviously better than exponential scaling, but it's still um, a pretty bad especially if you consider how simple this problem is. So you could say, well, now this is, uh, uh, now you could either give up or you could try to, uh, to hope that there are cases where you can actually sample even if your dimension is high. And then there are a few options. One is that you could just tell me that the Gaussian example that I showed you is, is meaningless. And I would uh, argue that that is probably not true because I can consider less trivial examples and show you that they are just as disastrous. Um, you could also say that, um, well, maybe secretly, the dimension of the problem that I have is small, which is often true. So often um, you might have a seemingly very high dimension, but all the interesting dynamics, for example, happen on a very low dimensional manifold. In that case, you can also do a, a sampling, I would say, but, um, but that may not always be true. Um, that every problem of geophysical significance has secretly a, a small dimension. I might not be. Uh, I might not be. I might not be willing to believe that statement. Then another option is that I'm missing something or look at the problem in the wrong way, and that's the one that I want to. Um, I want to spend a little bit more time on. So if you think about this problem that I that I showed you to illustrate uh, difficulties in high-dimensional sampling, it's a it's a actually isotropic Gaussian. So it's a collection of completely independent system components. And once you make, um, you know, the, the fact that you know this, if you can make that part of your sampler, then any dependence on dimension completely disappears as it should in such a simple example. So what I want to uh, think about is how can you extend this idea of using this problem structure? In this case, it's, it's a very dramatic problem structure of everything is completely independent. How can you use that in, in slightly more general settings where you maybe have, um, uh, not completely independent components, but maybe where you have uh, problems where the statistical interactions are limited to relatively small neighborhoods. Maybe you can find a, a, um, a similar structure that you can exploit. So I would like to try to explore the statistically uh, sparse problem structure, which tells you that correlations or also um, conditional dependencies are limited to small regions and think of that as the analog to a, to a sparse matrix, basically. And this also has a lot of uh, connections to what is known as localization in ensemble Kalman filtering or numerical weather prediction, if you're familiar with that. If you're not familiar with that, then I'm not going to uh, try to explain this too much. So some of the things that I have been thinking about is um, that in terms of important sampling, which is also sometimes called uh, particle filtering, you can see right now that there's uh, 
that there's many um, many techniques that are uh, uh, proposed. So if you, for example, open an atmospheric sciences journal, you, you I'm pretty sure that you can in any issue of the over the past couple of months you can find at least one paper that shows you how to um, uh, that suggests an algorithm that basically tries to. Oop, now I'm getting caught up in my in my slides. That basically says that they're going to transfer what is known as localization to, um, uh, to a particle filter. And I would say that um, maybe, it's, maybe it's worthwhile to think about this on, on a more mathematically fundamental basis to really understand uh, what the underlying problem structure is that is being used or that you want to use or that you hope to find in order to make uh, good algorithms rather than just uh, proposing one thing that maybe works on, a, on the simple test problem but not, not anywhere else. And also, if you read those papers, you can often see that they are uh, performing not much better than um, than when you just use a linear or, or a linearized or a Gaussian sampling techniques. And and I've worked on understanding a little bit why. In short, the answer is that many of the test problems that are used are not uh, non-linear enough to really see any um, uh, any usefulness in these more advanced uh, techniques. And then for MCMC, uh, in some sense, it was easier to do uh, to do uh, to to basically prove some theorems in the uh, MCMC uh, uh, world rather than important sampling world. So we have derived some results on dimension uh, independent convergence rates of of Gibbs samplers, which is another type of MCMC that I haven't really talked to you about. Um, and this is limited to Gaussian distributions, where we could be very precise about what is meant by uh, the sparse statistical structure, because it's basically a statement about the covariance matrix and the uh, inverse of that covariance matrix. Uh, I've also looked a little bit at problems that are not Gaussian uh, using this Mahler technique that came up very briefly. And I, together with a student, I could, um, I could make a sampler NCMC sampler that scales to a problem that has a dimension of 10 to the 7 and that appears in pulse powered x-ray radiography. Uh, so that was that was a uh, that was good. And if I get to my um, examples, I will show you a little bit more about this. Okay, so I brought that up uh, a couple of times already, but basically what I think uh, is happening here is that you have an analogy in sampling to to what you already know or are familiar with from just a, a linear algebra. For example, if I want to solve ax equal to b, then and the dimension of x is high, then um, then I might have a hard time doing it. But if I know that the matrix A is low rank, then I have a then then that can be done. Or if it's a high rank but sparse, I also know how to do this. So you can find sampling. Um, or posterior distribution analogies to these uh, linear algebra problems, where you, if you, you, you you're in the low rank case when um, when you have a relatively few dimensions, and when you consider a high dimension that occurs because you have a you have a very fine grid. And this case is actually quite well understood. There's lots of theory, and there's also lots of practical algorithms that can exploit this. So if your dimension is secretly low, and you have a way to to find that uh, manifold, then sampling is not, uh, even if the dimension is high, is not, is not, not so difficult. What I'm interested in is to look at problems that, that look like this, where you have lots of observations and very short uh, length scales compared to the domain, and where you don't have, um, where you're not in the situation where you can, uh, say, change a basis and represent this function by, by just a few, uh, uh, terms in a, in a series. And then I'm quite sure that the actual the interesting problems are somewhere in the middle. And then I don't know, at this point, I don't know what to do <laughs> if that is the case. So I'm looking at two extremes uh, uh, in some sense also for um, mathematical convenience and because it's more doable. And you can um, summarize what I, what I told you so far in a, in a map where I have on the x-axis here the dimension of your problem. And on the y-axis, I have a, a pretty vague statement about the problem structure. So what else do I know about the problem that I can use to make my sampling algorithms more efficient? So if you don't know anything about the, what your problem looks like, I think you're pretty well off with using an affine invariant sampler. And then you can go to maybe dimension, let's call it 10 to the 2, and 
and you will have uh, a difficult time to find a good numerical solution when the dimension is higher. And that I think I already showed you with the Rosenbrock example, where the, where the solution by an inappropriate, the numerical solution obtained by an inappropriate sampling algorithm was, uh, was not looking at all like the solution that you were actually after. Now, if you have this sparse statistical structure that I, that I outlined a little bit, then you can get to higher dimensions. You can also, if you know that your problem is Gaussian or nearly Gaussian, you can find very, uh, very effective sampling mechanisms. And if you have both, so if you have a nearly Gaussian problem structure and, uh, and these sparse statistical uh, interactions, then you can go up to, um, to extremely high dimensions. And I believe that this is the reason why um, some of the Monte Carlo techniques that are used in numerical weather prediction have been so successful. And you can solve pretty much any problem if the, uh, uh, the dimension of your problem is uh, seemingly high, but, uh, but effectively it's very small. Okay, so now I want to, uh, let me check, let me check the time. Okay. I'm very excited to talk to you about the uh, transdimensional MCMC, and this is uh, I assume that I talk amongst friends, so this is not um, this is not all thought through, and uh, I have not published anything on this, so it's a, it's a very much a, a view into into my office and what I'm what I'm thinking about. So what it, why why is it called transdimensional inference? I think you can explain a lot of what is a lot of the. Uh, um, interesting, side, interesting ideas here just by going back to the good old uh, problem of fitting a polynomial. So in Arizona, for example, I taught a linear algebra class and then you do least squares and you typically see that you are given a number of points and then you set up ax equal to b and you interpolate. So that's pretty easy, but it gets a lot harder if I don't tell you what the order of the polynomial that, that I want you to interpolate, what, what that order should be. Uh, so you can think of uh, extending the uh, uh, posterior distribution in this Bayesian framework to make the model order or the model complexity part of the solution that you compute. And that's when you start talking about um, transdimensional uh, Bayesian inference or transdimensional Markov chain Monte Carlo, because you will, in the process, you're considering models of different complexity. In the simple example of, of polynomials, you would just consider polynomials of order, say, two, four, or six and then figure out which one is the most appropriate one. And that causes problems with the, uh, with the typical MCMC machinery because your Markov chain sampler now has to jump from a space of dimension three, say, to a space of dimension four. And that's why also it's called a transdimensional. Okay, so here is now <clears throat> an extended version of the posterior distribution that I already showed you that takes the uh, model order into account. So if you, I like to think of, in the back of my head, I always have this uh, polynomial example uh, uh, in my head. So K here would be the model order. So maybe the degree of the polynomial. Theta are the parameters. So if I, if I tell you I want, to, I want you to, um, to fit a linear function, I, I need to tell you I want two parameters. And then I also need the value of those two parameters. So that would be the K and the theta. So K would say, I want a, a, a line, and then theta would be what the, uh, what the two parameters that define the line are. And then you can shuffle the, you know, you can push this to the right and, and switch things around in the way that you usually deal with these distributions. And you find a likelihood, which is the probability of the observations given the model error and the set of parameters. So that is just like what you've seen before, because now you have already picked the uh, model order. So that's easy to do. That's just the typical uh, observation model uh, prediction mismatch for a given um, um, for a given model order. Then you have a prior for the parameters, also given the model order. Uh, that also looks pretty much like what you're already used to. So you might use any regularization that you already like, or um, or any Gaussian distribution that you want to put there or uniform distributions. Once I know the model, era, model order, this is pretty much the same as, as what I've talked about now for the last half hour. And then you have another prior distribution for the uh, model order uh, K. And you also see that there's a, this is an interesting object because K is typically an integer 
and then theta is a is a vector that has that can take on any any value right that is not that is not an integer so it's, it's a little bit strange that you have these two types of of different numbers floating around but in particular this vector theta here will change dimension as you go as you as you draw samples from this distribution um, and that re requires if you want to use a markov chain monte carlo that requires a fix to the usual uh, metropolis hastings or sampler that i that i showed you and this is known as reversible jump mcmc and it is uh, uh, it was described in a in a paper in ninety five. So this in, in nothing of what I told you here is is new or my my ideas. I'm just telling you about this um, uh, this exciting uh, um, modeling and Bayesian inference uh, frameworks. Uh, you can also what if suppose suppose you can solve this problem, then you can solve another very interesting problem, which is which model should I use? So maybe you're not so interested even in which parameter exactly you should choose, but maybe you're just interested, okay, what should be the, what is an appropriate complexity of my model given that I have um, uh, these data points Y? And that you can do by basically integrating out the model parameters. So you're just left with the probability of a model complexity given a set of observations Y. And this integral is very easy to do if you have a Monte Carlo uh, solution. So if you have samples from this distribution, you would just look at the sample values of k. So this, this integral is, is, is trivial. Now, if you read, so I started to read two different threads of, of literature here. There's, a, there's one that is uh, long and you can read many, many papers um, from a statistical point of view. And I found one that is by now also pretty old, but I, maybe people have dropped it by now. So maybe I find a, a newer reference later, but they, you can find many papers that state uh, versions of these two statements where they say the ma major implementational problem for reversible jump Markov chain Monte Carlo, that's a trans-dimensional Monte Carlo, is that there's commonly no natural way to choose jump proposal. So you don't know, if you, if you remember from the very beginning of my talk, a Markov chain Monte Carlo sampler requires that you define a proposal distribution that says, given that you're here, where should you move next? And then with what probability should you accept that move? So making these proposals is, is pretty tricky to do. And then these guys even say that um, maybe for these reasons, uh, this um, um, transdimensional MCMC has pre predominantly remained within the domain of MCMC experts. Uh, I don't know if that is true because there is a whole other set of, um, of literature uh, by, for example, Kerry Key, who was here um, uh, for, for a long time, a guy called Sambridge and many, many others. So there's lots of uh, papers you can read in the geophysical literature, which basically go along the lines of, I'm just going to make an algorithm. So I make, so they, the, the, statistics, the statisticians complain that there's not a commonly natural way to choose these jump proposals. And then the geophysicists just make one, um, maybe tune a little bit and then, and then solve these problems. So it's, it is not true that I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not so sure about this second statement, but it's definitely true that making good proposal distributions in the trans-dimensional setting is, is not easy. So I, was, I started to think about how to make a, a good general purpose sampler for this, uh, for this type of problems. And uh, given that I know that these affine invariant samplers are pretty, um, pretty uh, robust, if you don't know very much about the problem structure that you might have, and they require only very little uh, tuning, I was tempted to make an, an FN invariant or at least an ensemble sampler for these trans-dimensional um, problems. And I want to make, again, make very clear that this FN invariance property does not really help you in, in high dimensional problems. So if you go to uh, very high dimensional problems, it's likely that you need FN invariance and then something else. And I'm not at that something, something else yet in particular with the, in the trans-dimensional case. Now, the way that I see it, there's also reasons for uh, not using um, FN invariants or at least the ensemble samplers ideas because if you want to use an ensemble to propose moves and you have this trans-dimensional problem, one way to do it is that each ensemble member now has, um, um, has basically every possible model order that you're willing to consider in it. So that, re that means that the scaling of the, of the dimension of the problem um, is is pretty bad, and I'll show you. Uh, I'll show you now how to how to basically do it. So you can go to these large product spaces. That is also not my idea. It's a, a 
taken from uh, relatively old papers by Gotzel and, and these two guys. So you make you make a new vector, capital theta, which now has um, uh, parameter vectors in it that are of model order one, model order two, up to the um, maximal model order that you're willing to consider. And then you can figure out how large this vector is. And it's, uh, it's basically the vector is uh, roughly uh, n squared or n max squared, where n max is the maximum dimension you're, you're willing to consider. And then you can um, write down a posterior distribution for this um, high dimensional vector. And you see that there's a pseudo prior that is, uh, that is popping up. And then the pseudo prior basically disappears once you take the marginals that you actually care about. But it helps you to take a, to take a, um, a trans dimensional problem and by putting it in this higher dimensional space, uh, view it as a fixed, that basic, essentially fixed dimensional problem. Now you have again the problem that you need this, um, that you need to define the pseudo prior, and what you choose here is a little bit um, uh, hard to think about, and also any choice I think would be hard to uh, defend because it basically tells you what should I know about the models that are currently not active, given that I have uh, labeled one of my models as the active model. Uh, so I don't know uh, what to choose there. But there's a trick again that was basically uh, formulated in 2001 um, that, that shows you how to set this up that basically everything that is difficult will, um, will eventually uh, disappear because if you make a good choice here, you basically get back the reversible jump samplers that are, that are not living in this, um, in this higher dimensional product space. And if you, if you accept this uh, background, then it's actually pretty easy to to make an ensemble sampler for these transdimensional problems. And I have again a cartoon to try to, um, to, try to illustrate how this is done. So here I have an ensemble um, of three members. So this is ensemble number one, ensemble number two, and ensemble number three. Ensemble number one says the dimension currently should be one. Ensemble number two says it should be the maximum dimension that I am willing to consider. And ensemble number three says it should be three. And then they all have parameters for every possible model. And they're not the same. So this theta two is not the same as this theta two. That's why they have a different superscript. And now I want to, um, I want to update this ensemble. And I start by proposing a new model order for ensemble member one. So I'm going to choose, uh, uh, I'm going to choose two. Uh, so this one is now the active one. Now, just like uh, in, the, in the fixed dimensional case, I'm at random choosing a, another ensemble member. In this case, it's number three. And now I'm going to um, basically draw a line between the theta two parameters of these ensemble members and make, a, make this stretch move. And then I accept or reject. So uh, well, maybe, uh, maybe I was very uh, optimistic when I, when I said this, but it's relatively easy to implement because this is, this is the actual stretch move. So you, 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 cho oh, sorry. you, choose, a, you choose a friend and then you can, you, you can consider the difference between your friend and yourself. And, and there's one random variable that, is, that, you can, that you have some control over, but there's only one. If you are, um, there's only one parameter. If you go to samplers that don't have this affine invariant property. And I'm not 100% I'm not sure that the way that I have it here, it is actually uh, uh, affine invariant. So it might be nearly so, okay? Because I'm not so sure about this, um, the separation of my model order moves and the, and the, and the subsequent stretch moves. So um, I, should be, I should be a little bit careful, but at least there is not so much that you can tune. And then, um, and then it might be, uh, might be easy to do. Uh, and as I said, there's issues with it that you have, that I just said, that you mix these uh, integer uh, model orders with a, with a continuous uh, 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 numbers here. And that might be, not be done as of now in a, in a particularly great way. And also that because you look at these, um, you look at these uh, uh, high dimensional product spaces, the dimension of the problem pretty quickly gets very large. Now I can maybe very quickly, how much time do I, I have a few minutes left? Can I show you two examples? 
Sure. Yeah. No problem. I, I don't think we have a formal time limit for the seminar, so you can. No, I, I don't want to keep long you longer want. than an hour. So let me just quickly show you uh, two examples where I use this. Okay, just to just to get familiar with the algorithm. So I have here a data set that was done uh, here. It's called the PADM 2M data set, and it tells you the um, strength of the dipole as a function of time for the last two million years. And, um, and you see that this quantity occasionally switches sign, and that is a, a geomagnetic, uh, that is a reversal of the, of the uh, geomagnetic dipole. Um, now you can try to make a model for this time series, and you can, you can say, I want to model this by a, by, um, um, diff a stochastic differential equation. So I have here a drift term F, and then I have a Brownian motion that drives my, my differential equation. And now one way, and I'm not saying that this is the best way to do it, but you can basically look at this as a regression problem. So you can discretize and you have a DT and you have a delta X and delta T and you have F of X. And then you say, well, this is just noise. So now you see that this basically looks like um, um, AX, well, F of X equal to B. So it's a regression problem and you can, you, you can do this. So now you need to choose a basis for F. I used uh, odd polynomials, so then I can use my favorite least squares, but that might not be a, a great choice. And I have uniform priors, so no additional regularization on any of the of the uh, problem of the of the uh, parameters. And this is what comes out of an algorithm of this type. So you see here, for example, I run this uh, transdimensional ensemble sampler, and then I can look at a histogram of the polynomial degree of the models that have been visited, and you see that the sampler likes a, a third degree polynomial and rather rarely uh, visits uh, an 11th degree polynomial. And then you can also look at um, what the parameters would give you, what type of model you would, you would get uh, for picking a degree three, degree five, or degree seven polynomial. And then you see something uh, interesting here. This is, the, um, this is just a histogram of the, of the data that I used to, for the regression. And you see that this, um, you know, in the region where I have data, all the models actually quite agree. But then, what the transdimensional setup seems to um, seems to uh, do for you is that it does not choose anything that is particularly complicated in these regions where I don't have much data. So you see that this all the models of degree three obviously are very simple in that in that region, and then um, and that's why maybe they are they are visited more frequently. You can do the same for. Uh, or something very similar for estimating the diffusion. So rather than estimating f of x, you want to put here a sigma of x. So this would now be a function. Um, and you can see what happens then. And then the situation is quite different. So um, here I choose uh, uh, even polynomials. And it likes a very simple model that are just a constant. And then it also likes pretty high dimensional uh, or pretty high degree polynomials of polynomial degree eight. And again, you see that in the regions where I have some data, there's, there seems to be some kind of overlap between the, the models of the different degrees. And then with Steve, uh, Steve's help, I could also use this on the, um, uh, on the Schlumberger data set, um, where you now have a, a, a layered model. So you have, uh, each model is a piecewise constant function, and you have to you have to define where the breakpoints are and and what the what the value of the jump is basically. And uh, I've considered here a maximum of twenty layers, uh, so that the, here here shows you a little bit how that that the scaling with the dimension is 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 a little bit tricky. So I have a twenty layer model, so I have 20, 20 breakpoints, and that means I have forty variables maximum, and then the scaling of the of the of the uh, vector that I have to keep for my ensemble approach here is 820. Now that could possibly be uh, 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 dealt with by not using a piecewise constant, I should say, not piecewise linear basis. But uh, but I haven't done this. So what I want to show you is that this is the the solution that Steve computed by uh, re uh, resurrecting uh, his old codes. That's the Occam uh, inversion. And then the, uh, and then I, I computed these uh, uh, samples from a transdimensional posterior distribution, which you see in in yellow here, and then the fit to the data is actually quite good, and you can also see that the 
um, transdimensional setup seems to favor models that have maybe degree in nine, uh, sorry, nine layers and not, uh, not 20. They are very rarely visited. And maybe with that, I'll just, uh, I'll just stop talking and, and take questions if you have any. And I want to thank you for coming and listening to me and also seeing, um, uh, hearing me talk about um, these transdimensional things that are not, um, you know, they're not fully, uh, they're not fully polished. So I appreciate that I get the chance to show this to you early and get your feedback on it as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Mati. Very nice talk. And uh, now we are ready to take questions from the audience. Please make sure to unmute your microphone before you talk. Oh, Casey is clapping. Uh, well, I'll ask a question since there uh, seems to be silence while everybody's thinking. Um, what are the orange things on this last slide you've shown on the histogram on the lower oh, right? Yeah, sorry, I, uh, I should have said that. Um, so the blue one, the blue bars here, those are, that's a histogram of the posterior distribution. And then the, the well, it's not a histogram of the posterior distribution, the histogram of the number of layers that I saw in my Markov chain. And the, uh, the red one is are the model orders that I started the, my ensemble with. So I just want to make sure that it's not, you know, it's not stuck somewhere. It's, uh, it's actually distributing what I give it uh, in, in a seemingly uh, meaningful way. So you could in principle have started with less than five, but you chose not to. Yes. But you also see that it actually very rarely went to anything less than five. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, any more questions? I'm, I'm not Peter Scher, but I'd like to have a question to Huda Bach. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. So if one wanted to uh, use some of these, are there algorithms available that one could, could use to solve uh, some pro simple problems just to get a, a feel for this? Are there some software that you could recommend or, or papers that you know, describe how you would go uh, and uh, um, deal with one of these problems from A to Z? Mm -hmm. You mean a transdimensional problem or, a, or whatever? Any? I mean, just to start out with the simplest problem, because I mean, I don't, I can't really from these two simple models, it's hard for me to to, uh, to understand how I would proceed on a simple problem. Mm, I, uh, um, I would say yes. <laughs> I, I, I can, um, I can look and make a selection of of what I think are reasonable things to read to get started on this. Yeah. The transdimensional world, it's really a, a matter of, of uh, maybe taste. If you like statistics, there's mm -hmm. a lot of statistics papers um, that have almost no, uh, I would say almost no examples. And then there's a lot of uh, geophysical papers that have almost no theory. So I try to land somewhere in the it middle. Something, yeah, it needs something uh, in the middle, obviously. Yeah. But what about software that to do these kind of things? Are those? Yeah, I think there are also there's also some software. There is a, um, a reversible jump MCMC uh, in I think in R and maybe by now also in many other languages uh -huh. that you can use. And then there is also um, um, hold on. I, I can um, I can. Uh, as I said, if you write me an email, I'll be happy to give you more precise, uh, more precise. Okay. okay. But if you look for for these guys and for their recent papers, they, I know that at least one states that they have code that you can download. Mm -hmm. But I should say that I have not downloaded the code <laughs> or tested mm -hmm. it or worked with it or anything. I don't know. I don't know how easy it is. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also curious about the transdimensional Monte Carlo. Um, mm -hmm. Does it show? Uh, clear superiority over the, like the fixed uh, dimensional Monte Carlo in fitting the data or like creating a better models or it's just more complicated in you know, mathematically. 
uh, well, it it answers um, it it kind of answers a different, a slightly different question, right? If you if you say I'm going to let me just stick to my polynomial interpolation example, just mm -hmm. simple. Yeah. If you say I'm going to take these points that you gave me and I interpolate it by um, by a cubic, then I made oh. that choice, right? I I said it's going to be a cubic polynomial, and then um, and then I see what I get. Now, if you use the trans-dimensional setup, you're basically you still have to make a choice on the basis functions, but you but you don't say you don't immediately say I'm not going I'm only going to consider a degree three polynomial. You're in principle considering polynomials of any of arbitrary degree if you want. Mm -hmm. right? So that it would automatically uh, it it kind of tries it tries to help you avoid making a choice for the uh, model order and try to squeeze that also out of the observation that you have. I see. So it's effectively reduce the uh, tuning you have to do manually. It, it just hand uh, code to do, to do this. Because uh, obviously when you choose a three degree, third degree polynomial, you, there's potential for you to introduce human bias. But if mm -hmm. you let the code do it, then it's more, you know, objective, right? Yeah. So another thing you could do is that you say, I'm, I'm quite sure that I want a degree three polynomial, but I'm also solving a fixed dimensional problem with a degree two polynomial and a degree four and a degree five. And then you can use um, some type of model selection to figure out which is the most appropriate choice. But that means that you've then solved a, a handful of fixed dimensional problems and then mm -hmm. solve this uh, model selection problem, which is, which is in itself also not easy to, to do. Oh yeah. But if you can pull, if you, you know, there, the, if you can pull this off in a, with a trans dimensional approach, you get a lot more answers uh, possibly in a, in a shorter time. Although I think there's very little known about any type of scaling or it's also what, what would interest me is to figure out conditions under which I can hope that this solution actually has a meaningful, uh, that this problem actually has a meaningful solution, right? There, there, must be, there must be enough information in the observations to actually infer K and theta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I don't know how to a priori, for example, determine if that would be the case. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's, that would be very hard. I think that really relies on a lot of experiments on real data to see. I think it's certainly the case for some problems, but not the case for some others. You have to have some, I don't know, redundancy or, well, it depends on the nature of the your physical problem, obviously. I think yeah. uh, it's, it will be very interesting to see if there, if we can tell whether one method is better than the other, like the trans-dimensional is indeed better than the the, the, the fixed dimension method in fitting data or retrieving features in some specific data set or problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Any more questions? I, I think Ignacio is yeah. having his hand up. Yeah, Ignacio. Thank you, Dianse. So, Mati, I was thinking in, in the problem we were talking the other day about this construction of synthetic bathymetry. And I'm thinking in your trans-dimensional methods and what is going on, what happens when you have this kind of self-similar behavior of the different scales of your problem in which the fine scale have a small amplitude as compared with the amplitude you should expect in the, in the longer length scales. And if that, if that is a problem in, your, in the trans-dimensional method, considering that you will have larger amplitude in the longer scale as compared with the finer scale? Yeah, so I think what you're asking me is, do I have a multi-scale approach for trans-dimensional inference problems? Mm -hmm. And in that case, I have to, um, you know, I have to disappoint you and, <laughs> and say, I, at this point, no. Okay, because I, don't know I would think right. that if you know if you know the self-similar behavior in a certain way, you can also try to scale the amplitude of the different scale and try try the trans-dimensional method. Yes. If you know, of course, the self-similar behavior. 
Yeah. I have no thought about it. We have to talk yes. about that. <laughs> but I'm also happy to start a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit uh, smaller, and maybe, maybe think about mm -hmm. it, uh, one scale for now, because there's uh, it's not it's not that easy. This uh, try for me at least this transcendental stuff is is not, and I don't know exactly how powerful it is. If you read the um, geophysical literature, they solve pretty impressive problems uh, uh, already. So maybe I should, um, you know, maybe I should be more optimistic. But there. Again, I can point you to these mm -hmm. authors here. Yeah, uh, I actually already copied that, that reference. <laughs> uh, I see Brandon raising his hand. Brandon? Yeah, I just had a quick question about the ensemble sampling. Mm -hmm. um, so with the ensemble sampling, what happens, say, if you have a region where the posterior probability is sort of lower between areas that have high posterior probability, does that mean that everything sort of migrates to the highest mode and then stays there? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I should, uh, I should add that to the, <laughs> to the list of difficulties here. Actually, I, I, um, I maybe have uh, uh, put that under the rug. So if you have, you, you're talking about you have two completely, maybe completely separated regions of high probability. And mm -hmm. how would you go from one to the other, right? Yes. That's your that's your question. Yeah, that I don't I don't particularly think that um, the stuff that I've talked about today will will help with this. So I know that the ensemble samplers then also have a hard time because if you if you pick if you pick one ensemble member in one well and the other one in the other well and you make a you make a line, you might you you're pretty likely to end up in zero probability land. Which you should avoid, right? So, um, yeah, that is a that is a, an additional difficulty that I have not addressed at all in this talk. When you when you go to um, when you go to these uh, multimodal problems. Yeah, I I maybe we should talk about this at some other time. But I had a little bit of an idea of maybe how to deal with that, um, okay. and I'm not I sure of that. So, a student of Alexander has a recent paper in the, um, uh, where they where they actually solve a problem of this type with an affine invariant scheme that is that is not doing these stretch moves. So it's um, uh, I can send you that. That might also be interesting for you. That that would be interesting. Yes, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, more questions. Okay, I think then in the interest of time, let's uh, just wrap up here. Let's thank Mati again for his wonderful talk and we hope to uh, be able to uh, learn more about your work as, uh, as uh, time goes by. Great, thank you everyone for attending this meeting. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Mati. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention one thing. Um, the, the, I have recorded this meeting so um, this meeting will be available online at some point and at some places, which I haven't figured it out yet, but maybe um, Casey can help me figure it out. But uh, I think it's very good for people who cannot attend for various reasons to be able to uh, learn about the great work by Matty afterwards. Right, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Matty. Thank you.